Hello and thank you for watching. This is One on One on Plus TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. On this episode, we're one on one with a social entrepreneur, development consultant, and community organizer with over 15 years' experience working with thousands of young people across the private and public sectors. The founder of one of Africa's leading volunteer driven development organizations, Slum to School Africa, Orondam Oto. He's passionate about improving education and human capital development policies while promoting reform based leadership to eliminate socio-economic inequalities and achieve sustainable, inclusive and equitable economic growth. Hi, Aranda. Hello, thank you for having me. Good to have you. So, um, what inspired you to reach out to less privileged in the way that you do? Um, I think everyone, I would say everyone is, is privileged, mm. right? I wouldn't, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say we were born to be less privileged. We were born with almost an equal uh, um, playing field across, across, across the society. But unfortunately, we were born into certain families or certain countries or certain communities mm -hmm. that made us find ourselves having more in some cases or less in some other cases. But as a human, as individuals, we all have, we all have I, would, I would say, great potentials to mm. be to be so you're saying the person is not the less privileged it's the family and the community yeah it's the society into. we're born okay. into that makes us actually less privileged or or more privileged okay. everyone actually has a potential every child has a great um potential within them and depending on where they are born into or depending on the society or the communities those potentials will either thrive or you know or in some cases they might they might die mm -hmm. so um Looking at the country we, we find ourselves, you know, our nation, Nigeria, I would say we have great potentials as, as, a, as we have great potential as individuals. And the country also has a great potential, but we've not been able to maximize it. Mm. And so you see so many, so many social inequalities across various strata of the, of the society. And I think for me, I've always been very interested in seeing how we could bridge the gaps and how we can ensure that every, everyone is given an equal playing field to succeed and maximize their potential. Because when you imagine the fact that we have over 200 million people as, as a nation and over a billion you know, on the continent, mm -hmm. and every one of those people has the, have the potential to actually be you know, as productive optimally as you would find in so many parts of the world or with so many individuals who are extremely successful. But it tells you that if we are very intentional about giving everyone the opportunity to help them thrive, mm -hmm. then our nation should have should nowhere be where it is. And so, our continent should be nowhere on the developed, you know, as we see it. Okay. Today. Why did you choose education to bridge this gap? So education we know is basically like, you know, one of the most powerful quotes we've always always read from Nelson Mandela, he says that it's the most powerful weapon, you know. And it's, it's a weapon, actually. It's a weapon because with education, you can empower people. You can give them the resources. You can give them the ammunition to either build or destroy a community. Mm. You know, the people who destroy societies are very educated. The people who build societies are even more educated. So the quality of education and the kinds of education we we, we, we indoctrinate because almost it's a, it's a doctrine that you're, you know, educating and, 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 and instilling in young people that they go from different classes and different levels. It's a doctrine. So that indoctrination needs to be very intentional to say what's the end goal? Where do we want those people to be? And that determines the kind of nation you'll have in... In, 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 mm. in interacting family. with these children, what impact would you say you have noticed so far? What has changed? So I always say that some, somehow our society makes us judge monkeys by their ability to swim, you know, and fishes by their ability to climb trees. Mm. So you find out that our school system somehow has made, has, has, has given everyone, every young person, um, place them in a box and force them to fit into that box. So we don't give young people or we don't give individuals an opportunity to explore their potential. The society has told you in so many instances, you have to go to school, pass your exams to come out and get a job. This was f over 200 years ago. That was basically the, the culture. Over 100 years ago, over 50 years ago. That's not the reality today. And so you find out that so many young people are even tired of going to school because the schools do not maximize their potential. You know, we've confused education and schooling. 
And so we feel that when you go to school, automatically you become educated. But to be honest, sometimes school actually makes you less educated. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we are very intentional about helping young people maximize and, and identify what their potentials really are to make them productive members of the society. And so over the years, we've seen so many young people who we've actually helped them prioritize and focus on where their, their skills are. And we can see how it makes them love their education. It makes them love even going to school. It makes them want to aspire to be greater than what they already they, they, they thought they could, they could, they could, they could have been. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we're very intentional about specific education for specific, as in handling every young person as an individual, individualized based education, and not the cluster or, or, or you know, the, 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 the wholesome cluster where, you, where everyone comes into a classroom and you dish out a certain kind of content and curriculum expecting everyone to, to follow through. And I give an example. You know, you have situations where you have 50 children in a class and week one, 50 children are meant to complete the first chapter, mm -hmm. week two, the second chapter, week three, the third chapter, and week 10, the 10th chapter. By week three, some children are still struggling with week one. But the education system does not care. You know, by week five, some children are still struggling with the content or the cost, the curriculum for week two. Whilst you find out that there's some students in that same class who by week one, they're they are done with week five. Yeah. Because everyone learns at a different pace. But the education system today does not give everyone the opportunity to actually learn at their own pace. It's been so, auto, uh, I would say, automated. Mm -hmm. And not every child, not everyone learns at that same pace, especially looking at the same content. I like how you said education and schooling are two different things and I'm particularly very interested in the right kind of education for anybody. So if you have to break that down for people to understand what you mean, how would you define that education and schooling? So you have different types of education. You have the formal education, the formal education, the informal education, the semi-formal education. We're having a conversation. People are listening. That's a form of education. Definitely. You know, people sit down and watch televisions and watch different, different programs. That's a form of, of education. So when people go for conferences, that's a form of education. So when people sit down and take courses online, that's another form of education. In fact, the greatest form of education is the informal education, what children learn whilst growing up in the society, in the community, in their family. So we have just the formal education which is what happens in the four walls of a classroom. And somehow we've focused our entire attention in that, you know, in, in, in that space. Forgetting that that is that makes less than 30% of what a young person or what a, what, 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 what a learner can can get. So how are we ensuring that every young person, the society is built to give everyone a holistic form of education that is not dependent on what we just learned in the four walls of a classroom. And somehow we are judged by only what happens in the classroom. Hmm. You know, you come out with certifications and, and certificates and your success in life depends on only what happened in that classroom. And so when you find out that young people who can thrive outside the classroom but might not be able to thrive in the classroom would have a very huge challenge succeeding in life because the classroom has told them that they are not good enough. Hmm. Talking about you know. people that can thrive outside the classroom and not necessarily in the, in the classroom, we've had conversations regarding vocational training, um, paying attention to people that have gotten a certain kind of skill sets from a younger age. What, how would you rate the importance of um, prioritizing vocational training in our education? So I think that's also, so it depends on the classroom because when I mean classroom, I, I'm talking about the way we've confused schooling today for education. Mm -hmm. Now, vocational education is also another very important form of education. You know, I say this to friends, we need to normalize and accept certain professions as, as great professions as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the society automatically looks down on the plumber, you know, an electrician, you know, a, 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 a technician. There are certain professions that you would say, oh, I'm a barber. And the society looks down on you. You know, I give an, an example with my baba, you know, and I, I made that, that analogy during, the, during, during this COVID pandemic when everything was shut down. And at some point, every other time he reaches out and we sat down one day and said, let's even see how you can build a business that is not, that's not conventional with what you have been used to. Now, you're a great baba. 
you earn about 60 to 70,000 naira monthly working where you are. But you have a phone with over 200 clients that you cut every other month. So imagine if you went to their homes to cut all their hairs and you built a good relationship with them and they referred you to other people. It means that every day you could cut five to 10 people. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a week, you could cut 20 people. Now, when I come into your salon, you charge me 3,000 naira. When you come to my house, you charge me 5,000 naira. Now, if you cut 20 people in a week, that is 100,000 naira. In a month, that is 400,000 naira. And he did that in July. In July, he made over 380,000 naira. That's from 70,000 from, naira. From 70,000 naira. So mm -hmm. you can imagine how he scaled his business by thinking of an unconventional way. Now, this guy, when you look at his net profits, it will be running over to, into over 200,000 naira. Now, this young man will be considered a failure in the society. But we have lawyers today who do not end up to 200,000 naira. We have doctors working in certain places who do not end up to that amount. And this is just a very, you know, this is just an, you know, an, a surface analogy. I don't want to go into technicians and plumbers mm -hmm. and all forms of mechanics and different. These are people who are successful in various forms of, 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 of you know, various, various careers and various jobs. But the society has made us understand that if you're not a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or an, or an accountant, there's certain professions that if you don't find yourself there, you are not a successful. For example, you take, 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 take teachers. We're talking about education. Mm -hmm. The teaching profession is one of the most downgraded professions in the society. And it begins from even the policies our education system has. For you to study, to become a teacher, you need to go to the College of Education. And to go to the College of Education, which is not the, at the same level with the university, yeah. right? It's seen as a, 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 a sub-level. You know, it's not even for those same... that couldn't make it into the university. Exactly, for mm -hmm. those who couldn't go to the university and even who couldn't go to the technical colleges which are or the polytechnics, which are even lower grades. Mm -hmm. To study even accounting, you need to score maybe 180 or 170 in some cases. If it's, if, if it's, if it's not a very high respected course, maybe 150 mm. over 400. But to go into the College of Education, to study to become a teacher, where you're going to be teaching the students who will end up coming to become the future of the nation, you need to score a mean, a maximum, in fact, in some cases, it's between 90 to 120 mm. as a cutoff mark in JAMB. Now, it tells you that the College of Education have been designed to be for the, the least, the least qualified, those who could not make it to the university. And then, when you go into that space, automatically you're going with a mindset that I'm not the best. Yeah, and there are same people that are supposed to train the people that are supposed to be the best. Exactly. Okay. So you realize that even becoming a teacher in our society is not a respected. And so you have people who are in the classroom teaching not because they love to teach, but because that was the least option. I'm not saying this is the, 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 the reality because we've seen lots of great teachers who mm -hmm. go into the classroom to teach because they have the passion. But if we should take a poll, amongst a hundred teachers in public schools and ask them if they wanted to take another job. We've done this severally and you see that over 70% actually want Once something better. So okay. how do you think they would teach in that class with passion mm -hmm. and conv you know, conviction that they are there to build and mold the leaders of tomorrow? Of, of, of tomorrow? All right, let's go on a very quick break. But when we come back, we'll definitely carry on this conversation. Welcome back. This is the 101 on Plus TV Africa. I still have um, the founder of Slums School, Otto Orandam. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, us. so eight years pushing on. I mean, when this started, I think I can remember when Slums to School started, and it was like a very huge dream that is unbelievable, right? And you're here right now pushing on, and even in the face of the pandemic, where a lot of sectors have been affected you still decided to build um, what we call the virtual school for the less privileged, right? How is that project coming and what exactly do you aim to achieve with that? So we've, we've, we've said this for so many years that 20 years from today, classrooms might not be what they are today. Mm -hmm. You know, even 10 years from today, students would not learn the way they're learning today. You know, five years ago or maybe 10 years ago, we didn't have things like, we didn't have... We didn't have we didn't have Instagram and and Uber, Airbnb. You know, we didn't have so many of this technology that we have. Take for example Uber. Uber came in and disrupted 
the way transportation was done. Yeah. You know, Airbnb came in and disrupted the way we had hotels and, 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 and residential, you know, um, let's and, 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 and so many, so many, you know, innovative technology have come out in the last five years and disrupted the way life has been for, for so many of us. And, and I think education is also on the verge of that disruption. You know, very soon you realize that students will sit down and across the world they will pick their teachers. We could have an Uber, for example, for teachers, hmm. where a teacher in Lagos is teaching students, 500 students across the world. Because education literally is without walls. You know, we built our universities, and it's only in Nigeria I see universities with fences. I guess we're beginning to see a bit of that in the professional course area, where you have to go to platforms like you Udemy can, to you choose can, what you, you want today to Today we work. have Udemy, Coursera, mm -hmm. EDX. We have so many platforms where you can sit there. And in fact, all universities are actually even going online. Today, due to the pandemic, over 50% of students in some of the top Ivy League schools are not going to be having physical classes till 2021. And so it asked, I asked myself so many times, why would we have over 70% of students who want to write JAMB or who want to go into the university? They've written JAMB, they've passed JAMB, but the university doesn't have the capacity to take over 70% of students. Hmm. They so have to wait for say, the next year. Would you say we are remotely ready for this future that you're saying? You know, you, 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 no one is ready for disruption, mm. right? No one, and I wouldn't say it's specifically, specific to, to us as Nigerians. Across the world, when technology comes, and that's the, that's the role of technology. A decade ago, we were in the industrial and the, the agricultural era. Mm -hmm. You know, today is digital, is, is basically a digital and technology driven, you know, society. And this, the way the technology would disrupt so many things, we don't have to be ready. We just need to flow with it. And so, Learning would actually be very much digitalized. Young people will be able to learn at their own pace. In fact, at a, a, fast, a fast speed. It's not going to be as it's always been where you sit down in the classroom and you have to copy from the textbook or from the, from the blackboard mm -hmm. what a teacher has copied from the textbook. And you spend seven hours in a day copying each other. Whereas you could just sit down on your device, watch a video, and in 30 minutes you've, copied, you've covered the cost content of what you could have spent five hours copying and copying. Now, when the pandemic actually broke out, we thought to ourselves, what do we do to keep these young people learning? Of course, they were very marginalized because so many schools still had the virtual class and the virtual program mm -hmm. you know, running. But we realized that so many of our young people were not learning across the communities. In fact, they were going out to hawk, they were going out to sell, they were so, in, in so many forms of abuse. And we needed to keep them engaged. And getting them, to, getting them digital devices wasn't enough because you could get a digital device and the child is still not using it because the parents really do not care. They, do, they don't know, they, they don't know the, 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 the value and the importance of education. And so we had to get the consent of all the parents that of the kids we support in the communities where they, they live to say, we to get, give your, your, your children learning devices with internet connectivity, mm -hmm. you know, and... and, and, and and power banks to charge them, you know, and, and have com community solar powered kiosks in some cases where they have to charge laptops and all of that. And we want the children to be part of a program. They don't have to go out to sell. So we have to provide palliatives and food stuff for the families so that the children could actually even have food, food items. And when we had given them the devices, we felt that it was not just very convenient sitting down in front of a laptop and talking to hundreds of children. You couldn't even tell who's in class and who's not in class and who is paying attention and who's not. And so that was where the idea came to build a virtual classroom. Okay. You know, and when, we, when, 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 when that idea came, we looked across the world. There were just three universities that had virtual classrooms. Of course, Harvard Business School was one of them. But when we saw how much it cost to build those classrooms, it was or studios, they were really very expensive. But interestingly, you know, we were able to build the first the first, you know, um, um, in Nigeria and even on the African continent. And it was just a new world of, ex of, of experience. You could sit down and see children across different, on, on huge screens. You know, you could tell if a child is not paying attention, if a child is learning, if a child is not in class, you could tell, uh, they, could, they could engage with themselves, they mm -hmm. could connect with themselves, they could connect with the teacher. You know, it was almost like they were in a physical classroom, but across various parts of, 
of, of, of, of, of, of the state and the country. So we launched with about 948 students and um, today we are, we are gradually scaling up. We've got mm -hmm. various partners coming on board from ESPN to Alitio Capital to Microsoft, who gave us over a million licenses for students for free and over 500,000 for, for teachers to Zenit, you know, life insurance that is coming on board to, to get 300 additional devices. And, mm. and, and, and so we are just seeing a huge, a huge interest in people wanting to embrace this, this form of learning. I hear the goal is 10,000 students. How soon would that be happening? So, you know, for us, we are very, I would say we are very realistic, even though we try to be ambitious. And I don't think that is even a, a huge ambitious goal when we look at the gap across the country, considering the fact that we have millions of children. I saw data on your, on your screen this, this morning um, that we have over 16 million children who are currently out of school. Mm -hmm. These are not children who are in school already. These are children who are not out in of school. school and have never been to school. If school resumes tomorrow, they would not be in school. 16 million. This is way much more than... Over, over, over 100 countries. I mean, the population of... We don't have up to 100 countries who have their population at 16 million. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the potential of 16 million educated, and I mean quality education, right? It's, it's, it's extremely astronomical if we could give them the skills and ask them to maximize those skills to, co to contribute positively to the economy, the GDP. Nigeria mm -hmm. is nowhere compared to, you know, as in our, our, our level and our pace and the quality of development we should have is nowhere compared to what we have today. Mm -hmm. And so we do what we do because we see this potential. We see the, 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 the desire in young people to learn, right. but the platforms are not there. Yeah. You know, the support is not there. And so imagine if we never got that kind of support when we were young, we wouldn't be sitting down here today. Yeah. Imagine 16 million children who have the opportunity we had as young people. Imagine what the future of our nation will be okay. from the north to the south, to the east, the west, everywhere, how they will contribute to a nation. And it's also very important because I always say that as a nation, we need to be intentional about creating a vision that people can buy into, right? Mm -hmm. A vision that is so inspiring that I want to contribute to that vision. So I put down my personal interest and my interest becomes how can I contribute towards that vision. And so our education system needs to be designed in a way where it's contributing to a vision for a nation. So right mm -hmm. now we don't have that. And that's a huge gap. Okay, so looking at how we know that this is definitely going to contribute to the country as a whole and even the continent, are you going to look at working with the government to get these things done? Because it looks like Slum to School is deliberately not trying to meddle with the government and getting the job done. But don't you think working with them would help um, make this I would, faster? I, would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't want to say you're wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> because we work very much... For us, one of our core values is co collaboration. Okay. And collaboration with the private sector, with the non-profit sector, what we call the civil society. Um, collaboration with the government. You know, it's not competition, actually. Mm -hmm. It's collaboration because it's only when we come together that we can actually build strong societies and, 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 and bridge great and giant gaps. And so we collaborate with the government identify schools in some of the underserved communities and see how we can work together to improve the infrastructure, to improve the, the enrollment rates, that's access, mm -hmm. to improve policies, to ensure that teachers are trained. If we don't have the, the capacity, we provide more teachers. Of course, we do a whole lot with government. Okay. And we are very big on identifying what the real bottlenecks are so that we could influence policy. And to, to influence policy, it's only, it's only at the legislative, mm. uh, you know, arms that we can we can work on that and so there's a whole lot that we have to do at the state level at the federal level with different arms of government mm -hmm. because at the end of the day if the, ch if the children succeed we succeed we want to get to a point someday where there wouldn't be a need for a slum to school africa right mm. where as an organization we become obsolete because every nigerian child 
actually has the best and the state is providing that best for them, mm. which is the primary responsibility of the state because Definitely. as individuals and as organizations, mm -hmm. okay, you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, our time is almost up, but before we round up, um, what do you think about the curriculum and um, if there is something you would definitely want the government to change or the stakeholders, like you have rightly said, sit down to um, change, what would that be when it comes to the curriculum? So I, I would say, firstly, every curriculum, right, is meant to be designed for a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that purpose is still relevant today. I don't, I'm not very certain if our young people are still learning for a, for a very relevant purpose. Uh, if I should ask what is the vision of our nation, right, as a country, what is our vision? Mm -hmm. Who do we want to be in the international community? What goals do we want to achieve? If I should ask a young person in primary two or in GSS two or in SS two or even in year two, right? I'm not sure why I'm using two, but if we should ask random, get a random sample and ask them, what's the vision of Nigeria? I can tell you that nobody will tell me. No one. I'm not, I wouldn't want to ask you on I air. was going to ask you, what exactly, is the vision of Nigeria? Exactly, because we don't have a clear vision. Right. So right. we need to have a clear vision we and then need, as a country, create a curriculum that... have a clear vision. Mm -hmm. That vision is what will let us now maximize the resources we have. The, okay. the, and I'm speaking about the human resource, the time resource, the, the financial resource. Even in designing an education, educational curriculum that young people are going to... to so wait, and, and, and to put that in perspective, you look at China. China is the manufacturing capital of the world. Mm -hmm. They have... They are big on manufacturing. So people go into school knowing if I come out, if I, if I focus on this, I will be able to contribute to the growth of... And you can see the Chinese economy, how it has grown in the last 10 years. Just go look at that, that projection or that tra trajectory. The US is the technology capital of the world. That's where all the big technology comes out from. They are very intentional, very intentional in building an education system that drives and feeds into that with all the STEM education. Mm. You know, same thing with the, with Japanese, with the South Korean. So Koreans. if you have to give Nigeria a vision um, based it's, on it's, your experience, it's, it's not in my position. If you think about it, based on the capacity you have seen and helped to improve to a certain degree, I would say we could. Say I would that? say we could be the human resource capital of the world. Okay. And when you look at projections. Nigeria is going to have 400 million people in the next 30 years. We're going to be the third most populous nation in the world. Yeah. When you look at how small we are in terms of our geographical size, imagine 400 million people in a nation like this. Imagine 40 million people in Lagos. Now, if we are not intentional about building the human resource capital and ensuring that every young person is productive, whether they are in Nigeria or we are exporting them to other parts of the world, they are coming back with value, adding to the growth of the nation. That's a huge resource. And it's important that we start focusing and maximizing that, uh, that potential that we've got. And the only way we can do that is through quality education, Definitely. giving every young person the education that will help them thrive and succeed. Thank you, Aronda, for your time. Okay, thank you for watching. And of course, to catch up on this conversation and all exclusive content, do visit our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. And of course, please do subscribe. Also, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Plus TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. Enjoy the rest of our programming.